And as, as Kevin Finneran takes the podium, let me ask how many of you subscribe to Issues in Science and Technology? Raise your hand. How many of you have picked up a copy outside? How many of you would like to pick up a copy outside? All right. I strongly recommend that you pick up a copy outside. Take a look at this engaging journalism. Spread it out by sharing it with your friends and relatives. Give it to your neighbors as well as your small children. And then ask the question, how does it compare to all the other journalism in your life? And I think you'll find the answer is, it's pretty good. Kevin's responsible for that. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, you probably thought that was an ad. I thought it was a public service announcement. <laughs> Um, at any rate, for more than 30 years, the Academy has been publishing this magazine, which is intended to enable members of the scientific community to um, speak directly to the public. It's, it's non-peer reviewed, non-footnoted, meant to be reader friendly. Um, and it also publishes not just scientists, it also publishes articles by um, leaders in government, leaders in business, um, in the um, nonprofit community, activists, and so on. So, it's really meant to be a forum for the discussion that needs to take place between the scientific community and the public at large. Okay. Um, anyway, after um, hearing Susan um, talking about warmth and hearing um, Alan Leshner encourage us to get in touch with our hidden inner human, um, I'm going to begin with a joke, which I think is a sort of Turing test for whether or not you're a human being or not. Um, and, and of course, um, I couldn't have come up with this myself, and in the spirit of transparency, I'll have to say that I stole this joke. Um, but I stole it from Norm Augustine, who's a very respected member of the scientific community, and, and I need to confess this because otherwise the New Yorker fact checkers would find out anyway. Um, um, but although it's a stolen joke, the feeling behind it is true. Um, when I was invited to speak here, um, I said, oh sure, um, um, I'd ha be happy to do that. Um, but I did not know at the time um, who my fellow panelists were going to be. And when I found out that I was going to be lined up with these three superstars, um, I got a little bit intimidated, a little bit nervous, but also my head started to swell a little. I said, well, maybe I'm better than I thought. So anyway, I went home and I said, I said to my wife at dinner, I said, I said, did you ever in your wildest dreams imagine that I'd be on the same stage with people of this caliber? And she said, well, to tell you the truth, you were never in my wildest dreams. <laughs> on with the presentation. Um, the, um, when we talk about establishing trust, obviously the first thing we have to, you know, we talk about trustworthiness. And trustworthiness is really something we have to be responsible for ourselves. We've got to look at all the things we can do within the, the research process and the operation of science to make our, our work as reliable and um, believable um, as possible. So um, in that spirit, in, in the 1990s, the um, academies did a report called Responsible Science. And it, that was a time when the major concern was scientific misconduct. There were a number of very prominent cases of scientists who were falsifying data or doing other things that were suspect. So the report really um, focused on that, and its subtitle was um, Ensuring the Integrity of the, the Scientific Research Process. Um, it's a bit of hubris to be able to ensure it, so you'll notice that the current report done 20 years later is fostering integrity in the scientific process, because this is a continuing activity in which we all have to be um, engaged. Um, also, I wanted at the beginning um, to ruin this joke is to give you the punchline um, at the start of the presentation, which is um, although the committee was empowered to look at scientific misconduct once again, they decided that misconduct, first of all, it's hard to measure, it's, hard, it's inevitable, I mean, we are Scientists are human beings, even if we can't tell jokes very well. And people are going to do, there's going to be misconduct. That's going to happen, so we have to continue to look for it, police it, have systems in place to make sure we find it, and punish it when it occurs. But what the committee um, came to conclude was the more important concern was what they called um, detrimental research practices. And these are all of the shortcuts, slightly less than ideal, um, easy ways 
of doing science that's not quite reliable enough. And some of them are obvious using too small a statistical sample. Um, but then there are a variety of others that um, I'll sum up at the end. But the real question was, how do we make sure that those of us in the science community you know, exercise our responsibilities as effectively as possible? Um, and one of the, the, the interesting things that they started with is just looking how science had changed in the 20 years since the original report. And, um, and you can look at this and say, well, these are all the things that we admire about science. These are signs of improvement, that science is growing, its size, its scope is getting larger, it's getting more complex because of more interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, it's more important in society, so we're getting more attention, we're more calls for regulation, accountability. Um, it's more important for the economy, so there's more opportunity for commercialization. We're taking advantage of new tech, computer technology and to, um, to enrich our research. We're cooperating more globally, so we're bringing people from all over the world together. This is all wonderful. We're having greater policy impact. So this is all true, but all of this makes it more, makes the challenge of making our practices uh, rigorous that much more difficult. So all of these, as well as being opportunities and good things about science, are also risks that we have to respond to. Each of these things, for example, you're working with people from other countries, what is their culture of authorship? What is their culture of review and responsibility? How do you know that you can trust their authors? You're working across disciplines. There are very different conventions of who gets listed first on the paper, how many people get listed, and so on. So there are a variety of things that we have to be, stay on top of and negotiate. Um, I'm going to so quickly, I'm going to go through just a little bit of the data about misconduct, the things that get headlines. Um, here's somebody who managed to falsify data in 172 papers. That's worrisome that something like that was able to happen. So we clearly have to deal with things like that. But when we look at the, what we're learning from the NSF and NIH investigations, there aren't that many cases. In fact, this is, as you see over the years, um, the number of NSF um, findings of misconduct relatively small. Um, ORI is the Office of Research Integrity at NIH. Um, they've seen virtually no change over um, the previous decade. Um, then you get surveys and you get another type of information. So we've got um, a number of people anonymously saying that they did things that they're not exactly proud of or they know are, are a suspect. Um, then we looked at researchers with NIH funding, falsification you know, very small, plagiarism a little bit larger, but 10% admitting practices that are signing orders to credit, withholding details, all of that, many of the things that we fall into this category of detrimental research practices. Um, again, meta-analysis done by us. All of these, by the way, I didn't put citations on the slides. These are all taken directly from the report, which is available for free online at the National Academy Press website, and all of the citations and full data are there. Um, but again, um, you know, we don't know. You get very loose numbers. To, you know, 14% say that they suspect somebody else did it. Well, I don't know how to do that. Um, this again, looking at doctoral institutions, medical schools have a responsibility to themselves for investigating misconduct when it might occur on their campuses. So 96% had undertaken an investigation in the preceding year. Modal number was three to five. So. Things are going out there, but this also means that the institutions are doing their jobs. Um, plagiarism dropped a little bit. The use of, the, um, of software to detect um, repetition of phrases and so on um, captures a lot of this. But also we find that there are reasons, you know, same paper could be published in two places. It could be reprinted. Um, some phrases are simply impossible to avoid. Um, there are some things that, you know, a language we develop in science that just is the right language and we're going to keep uh, reverting to it. Um, but then the danger, what happens with the um, sort of new generation of what people call predatory or suspect journals that um, probably are not as rigorous. They're probably not running the plagiarism um, identification software. Um, retractions, another um, way of measuring um, you know, unreliability, possible misconduct in the scientific community. Again, nothing really very authoritative. You know, we have a number of retractions. It seems large, but if you look at the total number of scientific papers, probably not that large. Also, things are retracted sometimes because the authors identified a mistake themselves and brought it back. So, um, 
Fangerol found um, significant misconduct in uh, PubMed publications withdrawn. Um, other studies have found that the, the misconduct uh, level is somewhat lower. Um, so anyway, the caveat, um, through this, we, we don't have anything that tells us exactly how much is going wrong, how much um, misconduct is taking place, um, how many bad papers or papers that we, you know, are, are below the standard we want are out there. Um, but nevertheless, um, the, the important message of all of this is we're not as good as we would like to be, so we need to work harder. Um, reproducibility, another question. That's what wound up, you know, that was the, an economist headline that um, Kathleen pointed out and others that we've seen. But um, we all understand that there's, maybe there's some misconduct, maybe there's some confirmation bias that had somebody, you know, come up with a result that's stronger than the data justified. Um, but the truth is that um, some experiments are just hard to duplicate. Um, all of us try to use the recipes that we see in cookbooks. Cooking is relatively simple compared to science, and I know my experience is that I don't get it right, at least half the time. <laughs> but sometimes you're, you're working with human subjects, sometimes you're working with natural systems, you just can't recreate the original conditions. So you might not get the same results, but it might be impossible to get the same results. So, as I said, um, same thing. Um, how much of a re reproducibility problem do we have? Um, probably everybody's familiar with John um, Ioannidis' work, um, which suggest, suggested that there was quite a lot of what he calls systemic bias in, in the presentation of results. Begley and Ellis you know, re went through their, um, you know, a number of studies in hematology and ecology. They succeeded in reproducing only six. But again, they're working with human systems. Also, it just ignores the fact that some people are better at doing experiments. So the fact that their scientists didn't get the same results doesn't mean it was wrong, but it might mean it, it, there's a reason to do that experiment again, have yet another group do it. Um, and then the psychology studies. Um, same thing, found a, a lot of trouble. Anyway, what I really wanted to get to is try to, um, to get to some of these detrimental research practices that um, the community, I think, needs to be aware of, and you know, among ourselves, we try to get straight, um, but also we have to sort of communicate the fact that we are doing this type of stuff, the things that are happening in the scientific community that should increase our trustworthiness and, and subsequently our trust. And uh, so we have things like um, honorary authorship, demanding authorship in return for access to previously collected data, denying authorships to those who deserve it. Um, I mean, we all know these things have happened. The lab director that insists being having a, a name on the paper, the postdoc who does a lot of the work and whose name doesn't wind up on the paper. Um, some of the new challenges, not retaining or making available data, code, other information um, that's important that was essential to um, getting the results. Um, this is different. This whole world of infotech guided science requires us to think a lot harder about what, what we have to do, what our responsibility is. Um, someone who develops um, analytic software might be reluctant to um, release that code because it takes a long time to develop it and if you release it, everybody else can use that code and run their experiments and all of a sudden there are 100 papers and you say, that's great, but you don't get any credit for those papers. So we have to figure out a way maybe to give credit to that person that did the original code that's being used um, and make that you know, something in which they can build their reputation. Um, neglectful, exploitive supervision and research. Um, you know, this is the, the stuff that happens in the lab. Now this is, the committee decided not to look at um, sort of sexual misconduct and things like that, which is a real problem, but is not a research related problem but there are certain supervisory um, activities that have to do just with, with the research that I think we have to be careful of and make sure that we're not um, exploiting the junior researchers, postdocs, <laughs> graduate students. Um, misleading statistical analysis has become a real issue because this type of, once you start mining big data and trying to interpret it, um, many of the people who are doing this are trained in other disciplines and don't really know how to use the statistical models as effectively and as accurately as they should. 
So this is one of those cases where in our review, we have to make sure that when the statistics are a particular um, important part of the research that we have statisticians, you know, really expert in that area, reviewing the papers before they get out. Um, and then we have to look to the, um, the institutional policies, procedures, the sort of incentives, structures we create to provide guidelines, you know, to set boundaries, you know, particularly for um, young researchers as they're coming up so that they don't make mistakes um, out of ignorance. So the institutions that are funding and performing research have a response um, to do this. And, um, and then we have to worry about publication practices, journals, editors, peer reviewers, people. Um, some of these are familiar, but um, I think um, deserve more attention than the committee felt. Um, and try and also, to the extent we can, standardize practices across the disciplines, which is not going to be possible because the disciplines differ for reasonable and, and understandable ways, but at least get some agreement on the underlying principles that should guide the practices in all the disciplines. So that's um, sort of a presentation of the challenges and problems that the committee um, arrived at. And I am happy to say that I don't have to come up with the solutions, but we have a speaker in a much better qualified and much better position to talk about how the science community is responding to some of these challenges. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.